Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India take a lecture today on biomedical waste management and disposal, also management of occupational hazards that occur. Now what is biomedical waste? Any waste which is generated during diagnosis, treatment or immunization of human beings or animals, any used in research activities or in production and testing of biologicals and animal waste from slaughterhouses and other similar establishments. Now what is healthcare waste? You will see only 85 percent of it is non-infectious, only 15 percent is infectious or hazardous. Now what is biohazardous waste? It will mainly have infectious waste 10 percent which is sharps, non-sharps, plastic disposals, liquid waste and non-infectious waste which is around 5 percent of this that is radioactive waste, discarded glass, chemical waste, cytotoxic waste and incinerated waste. But you have to realize one thing any infectious or non-infectious biohazardous waste if it is mixed with general waste will render the whole waste as infectious. So even if the percentage is 10 to 15 percent, if it is not segregated it will render the whole waste as infectious. So what is the need of biomedical waste management in hospitals? Why should we do it? Now you see when the hospital waste comes out it can lead on to infections in patients, air pollution, if it is untreated and left, it can mix with sewage, with water, cause infections in people around. Then there are people who are doing rag picking, scavenging, animals, they all could get infected. Poor waste management could lead on to injuries from sharps if people are picking it up, increase in healthcare associated infections, risk of infection outside hospitals for waste handlers, general public, risk associated with hazardous chemicals and drugs disposals and drugs being replaced and sold, it could lead on to environmental pollution. Biomedical waste, so we know, can lead on to many diseases. One is AIDS, HIV infection, hepatitis B and C infection seem to be more, gastroenteritis it could cause, respiratory infections, bloodstream infections, skin infections or effects of radioactive waste if are there, it could also lead to on to intoxication. Now who is at risk? It could be us, the healthcare workers, it could be the patients or it could be our, the relatives or the people who are visiting these patients or healthcare providers. Now what is this waste? You can see the waste, it could be lying around, it could be these you know drips and all which, are, uh, which have been disposed of, disposed of glasses, disposed of gloves, all the IV drips, the syringes, all these could be the part of this waste. As far as guidelines are concerned, Government of India, Ministry of Environment and Forests in notification in, as in July 1998 had for the management of handling of waste, they had set certain rules. This draft was again changed in 2011 as there were some objections and suggestions. In 2016, for the review of these, so the management of this was the thought of its impact on the environment and also new rules were exercised. Now as far as the 2016 amendment is concerned, it has been notified by Ministry of Environment and Forest and one has to apply authorization from competent government authority, whoever is disposing of waste, generator of the waste is, waste is responsible for its segregation, segregation has to be done at the site of generation and there can be punishment if one is violating these rules up till 5 years or fine up to 1 lakh or both. These rules but do not apply to radioactive waste, hazardous chemicals under manufacture storage and import of hazardous chemical rules, solid waste under municipal solid waste, lead acid batteries, hazardous waste under hazardous waste management rule 2008 under the act or micro hazardous microorganisms like bioengineered micro cells under the manufacture, use, import, export and storage of hazardous microorganisms as well as rule 1989 under made under the act. 
what are the provisions of these biomedical waste rules? One is that you have to obtain authorization from the government. Second is segregation, packaging and storage. Third is transportation. Fourth is treatment and disposal. Then one has to make an annual report of your compilation as to what you are doing. You have to maintain records and if there is an accident it needs to be reported and also one has to generate an appeal and health education has to be there too as far as biomedical waste management is done. Now the different types of biomedical waste as far as the earlier rule of 1998 was concerned, there were you know human anatomical waste, animal waste and microbiology and biotechnology waste, they were all collected in plastic bags which were yellow colored. Waste which was sharp was in puncture proof containers, blue or white translucent uh, colored puncture proof containers were used. Discarded medicines and cytotoxic waste was again in a plastic bag which could be bla black or yellow. Solid waste soiled, solid plastics could again be in plastic bags and this plastic bag could be yellow or it could be blue or white. Incineration waste, chemical waste solid is in plastic bag which was black. This was in rule 19, uh, of 1998. Now the types of biomedical waste as far as the rule which has been generated in 2016 schedule 1 are different now. Now the biomedical waste is divided into four categories, yellow, red, white and blue. Now the yellow category should have a non-chlorinated plastic bag for this and the, it we can collect human anatomical waste, animal anatomical waste, soil waste, expired or discarded medicines, chemical waste, microbiota and other clinical waste, chemical liquid waste. Now, the liquid waste specially needs to go to a separate sewage and effluent treatment system. Rest of this which has been collected in yellow bag needs to be incinerated or plasma pyrolysis is done or deep burial is done. Now incineration is very high temperature oxidation of this and you know generate complete destruction of the waste. While in plasma pyrolysis very high temperatures are there but methane gas and other gases by carbon monoxide and others are produced which finally need to be destroyed. As far as the red bag is concerned, it is again a non-chlorinated plastic bag or container which has to be used and it uh, is used to collect contaminated waste which is recyclable. That is the glass tubings, bottles, IV tubes, sets, catheters, urine bags, syringes, gloves which are used in the hospital. They need to be again autoclaved finally or microwaved, hydroclaved or then sent to recycling. White containers usually they are trans should be translucent, puncture proof leak or tamper proof containers and they are used to collect waste sharps including metals and they again need to be autoclaved by or dry heat sterilization should be done followed by shredding or mutilation or encapsulation so that they cannot be reused. Blue bag usually they are cardboard boxes which can be used with blue colored markings. They are used to collect glassware. They are again disinfected finally or autoclaved or microclaved and then sent for recycling. So the yellow bag can have either human anatomical waste, could be human tissues, organs, body parts, dead fetus, could have animal anatomical waste, could be animal carcasses, body parts, organs, tissues, soiled waste that is items contaminated with the blood or body fluids, dressings, plaster casts, swabs, bags containing blood and other components, expired or discarded medicines which could be pharmaceutical waste, antibiotics, etc., cytotoxic drugs along with their glass ampules or it could be chemical waste used in production of biological and used or discarded disinfectants or it could be chemical liquid waste. Now chemical liquid waste is the liquid waste generated due to use of chemicals in production of biologicals and used or discarded disinfectants, silver x-ray film developing liquid, it could be discarded disinfectant, formalin, infected secretions, aspirated body fluids, liquids from laboratories, floor washings or disinfectant which are used in disinfectant activities or you could also put in discarded linen in this, mattresses, beddings contaminated with blood or body fluids, microbiology waste, lab waste which contains the blood bags, the lab cultures, stocks or specimens of microorganisms, live vaccines or retinated vaccines, then the cell cultures which are used in research and industry laboratories, also other dishes, you know petri dishes, devices used in cultures, all these comprise the waste which can go to the yellow bags. Now so, uh, you can see it 
pictorially also it contains all the lab waste, it contains the patient dressings and all which have been contaminated, could be the culture plates from the labs, it could be the tissues or it could be the pathological waste. As far as the red bag is there concerned, it usually is used to collect contaminated waste or recyclable disposable items, which could be the tubings, glass tubings, rubber tubings, bottles, IV tubes and sets, catheters, urine bags, syringes, vacutainers, gloves, all these which are collected in red bin and they are all reusable, that is the syringes, the glass tubings, gloves, etc. White or translucent puncture proof container which should be leak proof and tamper proof. It contains the waste shafts including metals, needles, syringes, needles from needle tip cutters, blades, it could be from the uh, all these things which have to be collected in the white translucent puncture proof container. Then card boxes with blue colored marking, they can be used to collect glassware, broken or discarded or contaminated glass including medicine vials, ampules which could be contaminated with cytotoxic waste, they could be metallic body parts also which are part of the waste which can be collected in the blue cardboard boxes with blue linings on them. Now the important thing which should be kept in mind here is where the waste is generated, segregation is the most and safe storage is the most crucial step. This has to be done at point of generation, how will it help us? It will reduce the treatment cost, it will reduce the impact on community, it will also reduce the infections to healthcare workers and there should be color coded bags separate out at the site of the segregation and storage. As far as treatment and disposal of sharps is concerned, this category includes the needles, capillary tubes, scalpel blades, etc., with syringes, broken glassware which has been contaminated with biological material. The contaminated or infected sharp should be placed in a puncture resistant container like we told you with disinfectant of say 1 percent sodium hypochlorite for a contact time of 30 minutes or autoclaved and then sent for final disposal when it is 3 fourths full. Now if the sharp is getting disposed of the same day, no need to disinfect. But if they contain medicine vials, ampules, etc. and uh, it contains cytotoxic waste, they should be disinfected by detergent or sodium hypochlorite or through autoclaving or microwaving and then sent for recycling. Non-infectious glassware can be discarded in heavy duty cardboard box, taped and sent for recycling. So the shops, they have to be put in these, destroyed needle and be put in the white container. But you should not try to cut the syringe tip because that will lead to uh, you know injuries. They can be straight away disposed of in the container, white container. Similarly for shops, they have to be straight away put in the white container. As far as disposal of liquid waste is concerned, non-infectious chemical waste can should first be neutralized and then flushed into sewer system. Liquid infectious waste should be treated with chemical disinfectant for decontamination, then flushed into sewer. And if either they are, finally there should be a provision of an effluent trans treatment plant through which this sewer uh, transmission takes place. Packaging and labeling, one should do seal and label the container before transportation to the common collection site. All the bags are to be labeled properly before transportation and each ward must maintain a log book as to how many packages were collected and sent. They should have biomedical waste containers and bags labels on them, biohazard symbol or cytotoxic hazard symbol depending on the kind of waste. The, for transport, the containers should have a date of generation, waste category what it is there, waste class that has been done, the description of the waste, the sender's name and address receiver's name and address and in case of emergency to contact whom and all these labels should be non-washable and prominently visible like this the, and the bags which are there as far as the good practices are concerned they should be filled with only two-third the capacity so that you can tie them from the top. You should put date of production, date of uh, waste category, all the labeling which should be done on the bags. And all the yellow and waste can be directly taken to the incinerator, waste storage, it can be done. Transportation, now it is important. All untreated should be waste should be transported in a vehicle as has been authorized by the competent authority. No untreated waste should be stored beyond a period of 48 hours. If it needs to be stored beyond this period, permission has to be taken from an authority. Microbiological waste and other clinical lab waste should be pre-treated by sterilization and disinfection as per WHO guidelines 
before packing and sending. Biomedical waste should be transported within the hospital by means of wheel trolleys that are not used for any other purpose. They should not have sharp edges, should be cleaned daily and a biohazard label should be printed on the trolley. We, the picture is showing two pictures, one is how it should be handled that it is covered with a biohazard label, patient the carrier is protected. The here the other picture the carrier the person who is taking is not protected and overloaded trolley is there, they can be spillage of waste and that has to be avoided. Again, it should not be transported near the patient care units, it should be transported away from patient care units. It should be transported in vehicles which have been designated by the authority to transport these uh, biomedical waste with the hazard symbols on them. And all these are need finally, they are taken to the autoclave, they are autoclaved and taken for shredding and we do sport testing weekly in the autoclave to see that it is working properly and they are finally shredded. Now important thing as far as waste management is concerned, another thing which is important is standard or universal precautions to be taken by all patients and lab for all specimens. Now the body fluids which can be potentially infectious could be semen, vaginal excretions, pericardial pleural fluid, CSF, synovial fluid, other unfixed pathological specimens. Now the standard precautions need to be taken which could be you know protecting yourself by masks, by gowns, by using goggles where splashes can be there and preventing from sharps. So the personal protective equipment is one main uh, ingredient of this which helps to create barrier to protect skin and mucous membrane and the item selected for use usually depends on the type of interaction that the healthcare worker has with the patient and the kind of procedure that is being done on the patient and the kind of diseases which can be transmitted through this. So and also we need to remove this PPE immediately, wash ourselves, wash our hands to prevent contamination of our skin and clothing. Now PPE could be gloves which we wear when we uh, touching blood, body fluids, non-intact skin, mucous membranes, they can be worn during activities when we are doing some sort of exercise where we are having vascular access or it is uh, you wear a gown when there is likely to be exposed, your clothes are likely to be exposed to fluid. You can also use surgical mask or gloves when or face shield then there is a chance of splash or spray of blood which may occur to eyes, mouth or nose. So the, we are, there has to be a certain sequence in which you wear your PPE. First you will wear your gown, then mask or respirator, goggles or face shield, finally you will do hand hygiene and only then wear gloves. You must follow this routine and for removing again first you remove the gloves, do hand hygiene, then you remove the face shield or goggles, gown and finally mask or respiratory. And where do you remove these? You remove this at the doorway before leaving the patient room or anti room and remove respirator outside the room after the door has been closed. One thing you have to understand these standard precautions do not apply to specimens like urine, feces, vomitus, sputum, saliva, tears or breast milk. They apply mainly to blood and blood stained fluids. The single most important way to control the spread of infection is by disinfecting the equip equipment and the surfaces after having come in use. Cover the mouth and nose when sneezing and coughing thorough hand washing and wearing gloves. These are very simple methods which can be done to prevent infection, prevent spread of infection. Now hand hygiene is important. What is important in this is that hand washing is the most important and how you do it. What we know in summary we know that bugs are on our hands, they need to be washed off and washing bugs off our hands saves lives. We all know this. So what is the problem? Why do not we wash our hands? There are certain reported factors for poor adherence to hand hygiene. It could be lack of soap, water or sinks, one could be very busy, insufficient time, understaffing, overcrowding can be there, patients sometimes need priority, low risk of acquiring infection for patients one thinks but one can get infections because of these factors. There are different areas of hand which you see, the areas which are marked red are the ones which are frequently missed during washing. Less frequently missed are the blue ones which are usually washed and not missed are the, the cream colored which are always washed. So how do we take care of this? There is a certain procedure of hand hygiene which should be followed that is first you should rub your palms together, then rub the back of both hands, finally interface fingers and rub the hands together, 
interlock fingers and rub the back of fingers of both hands, rub thumb boy in a rotated manner, rotating manner followed by area between the index finger and the thumb, rub fingertips on palm for both hands and rub both wrists in a rotating manner and then finally rinse. Now, there are 5 moments of hand hygiene which have been identified by WHO when you should do hand hygiene when you are in near a patient. One is before touching a patient, second is before clean or aseptic procedure on a patient, third is after you have been exposed to a fluid of the patient, fourth is after touching the patient, fifth is after touching the patient surroundings. So, all these are different moments of hand hygiene which must be followed. As far as duration is concerned, the hand washing by soap should be 40 to 60 seconds and 20 to 30 seconds for using the alcoholic rub. Best method of hand hygiene is using the alcoholic rub which is needs less time, easy access is there, better disinfection and they are with, they are with emollients. Efficacy of hand hygiene if we see good hand hygiene can be done with plain soap, better you can use a by doing an antimicrobial soap, best you can have by using alcohol based hand rub. Gloves do not take the place of hand hygiene, hand hygiene has to be done and it is an addition to gloves and not gloves alone. Wash hands with soap and water before doing any procedure, using 1 percent alcoholic hand rub is in between patient contact is important. Hand decontaminants you could also use 2 to 4 percent chlorhexidine, 5 to 7 percent povidion iodine, 1 percent triclosan or alcoholic hand rub. Surgical hand rub is usually around 4 percent chlorhexidine or povidine iodine for 3 to 5 minutes. As far as needle stick and sharp injury prevention is concerned, safe handling is important. This is important components uh, standard precautions and that are implemented to prevent exposure to blood. So, needle stick injury it is seen to transmit HIV in 0.1 to 0.3 percent, HBV in 10 to 30 percent, HCV in 3 to 10 percent. So, how should you take care? Use needle immediately discarded, should never be recapped, bent or cut, should not be removed from the syringe or uh, tube holder or otherwise manipulated. Any used needles, lancets or contaminated sharps should be placed in a leak proof puncture resistant sharps container labeled with a biohazard label and should not overfill the container. Safe handling, do not check the sharpness of the needle, do not pass one needle to from one person to another, do not try to recap the needle destroy the needle immediately after collection in a destroyer, needle destroyer. Accidental exposure can occur due to needles or due to spills. So, management one should not panic, one should not put the prick finger in your mouth, one should not try to squeeze blood from the wound which one usually does because this increases risk of transmission. Do not use bleach, alcohol, betadine or iodine which can be caustic, do not cause trauma by all this. What you should do is allow the site to bleed, cuts to be washed with plenty of soap and warm running water, splash if it occurs in nose, mouth, eyes, anywhere you immediately irrigate with clean water saline and report the incident to the designated officer in charge. Who indulges in counselling and medical management? First dose of PEP is taken within 2 hours, a post exposure prophylaxis should be taken within 2 hours if status of blood or body fluid of is known to be positive or even if it is unknown. Availability of free drugs for PEP should be there. So, what do we do? We do a pre test and a post test counseling, send the blood sample for HIV testing. First sample is baseline immediately after exposure, second sample after 6 weeks of exposure, third sample after 12 weeks of exposure and last sample after 6 months of exposure. During the follow up period refrain from donating blood serum or organ, abstain from sexual act activities, use condoms and do not breastfeed. As far as duration of PEP is concerned, start as early as possible within 2 hours, continue for full 4 weeks and PEP started after you should realize is usually not recommended because it is not effective and may not be useful. Is PEP recommended for all types of exposure or commercial procedures? No. All occupational exposures do not lead to HIV infection. Before starting the treatment, you must weigh the pros and cons of the risk of infection toxicity of the drugs. When the HIV source is not known, then also you should follow up the person who is uh, required depending on the exposure risk and status code of the person and accordingly decide. Different guidelines like I told you have been set, yellow category, the table is there that uh, it needs to be incinerated, what are the ways, red category needs to be autoclaved, what are the ways, 
white category translucent container what are the ways usually this is transported in puncture proof leak proof containers blue category that is the cardboard box with the blue colored making and the waste which have to be put in this the discarded glass. So, this is important to follow these four rules under these four categories which have been designated as per the guidelines of 2016. So, the take home message is yellow has blood, drugs and tissues, dead, plastics, tubes and syringe now go in red, sharps in translucent, lockable and white containers, black is for garbage. BMW not by right, cardboard boxes shall carry glass bottles and glasses, blue bag is gone, red bag is gone. So, it is mainly yellow, red, black and white. Thank you.